that's a very kind welcome. Thank you so much for that, Rubik. It's a joy to be with you and Fiona and with all of you. And uh, so many of us go back a, a long way. It's great to see the, the Bradys. It's great to see my man Bob Mosley from West London. Yes, And uh, so, so many of you, so many of you, the Burrs and, and Tootsils and everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity for us as a family to be here. We were a little bit nervous about uh, taking four of your places. But, uh, hey man, I'm glad it all worked out. And uh, let's go ahead and turn to Romans 1. Um, I can use that? Yeah. Okay, great. Do I just click? Oh, great. All right, the power of salvation. I think you guys are, are uh, kind of following along in a you know, similar sermon series to what we're doing in other parts of the UK. And uh, so we're about to kick off in the book of Romans. Um, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, dear Simon Dinning from the Belfast Church is... He's putting together a, uh, a teaching day, you know, a couple of two or three videos to help us have an overview of Romans, which you're very welcome to join or else the, you know, the videos will be available to you. And uh, I believe he also has put, if you go to on the, you know, Simon has a YouTube channel called That Bible Guy. So if you go to YouTube and, and, and look for That Bible Guy, uh, you'll find little uh, chapter lessons from Romans 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. I think he's got us far as Romans 4. So uh, there's, a, you know, there's a wealth of, of, of biblical knowledge and uh, aids as we study through the book of Romans. Romans is a uh, phenomenally useful and central book in, you know, in Christian teaching. Um, the, uh, one of my favorite teachers in, in our family of churches is Gordon Ferguson, who uh, many of you would have heard and uh, you probably read his books. And uh, he wrote one uh, on Romans called The Heart Set Free. And uh, in it, he basically says, kind of almost his intro is, uh, is uh, you know, when you get Romans, God gets you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Romans, you know, speaks to the heart of, of what we believe and, and kind of the grace that is found in God and in Jesus and in the gospel. And uh, so we're going to take a little bit of a look in Romans chapter 1 uh, today from verses 18 to, uh, 8 to 17. And, uh, oh, that was, I, I did this same lesson for the staff, so there you go, some announcements. Um, but Romans 1, 8 to 17, and uh, let's, uh, let's read together. Romans 1, 8 to 17, it says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in my spirit in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you. In my prayers at all times, and I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. I long to see you, so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. I'm obligated, both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish, that is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Amen. Uh, point one, God's plans are greater than our plans. God's plans are greater than our plans. You know, Paul um, was here in, uh, he was writing to the Romans, to the Christians in Rome. It was a, this is a church that he had not planted. And, um, you know, but he was planning to go there. And, um, you know, he, 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 he'd never visited there before, but he talks about how he's just so delighted because he's heard about their faith and uh, it's been reported. And uh, he's super, super encouraged about that. But he is now planning to come to Rome. And much later in the book of Romans, in fact, almost towards the end, we kind of discover the reason why he wants to go to Rome at this particular time. He says in uh, chapter 15 and verses 24 and, 20 and 25, he says, I, you know, I plan to do so, that is to visit Rome, when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there, after I've enjoyed your company for a while, now, however, I'm on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. So, you know, um, many of you know that Paul did three missionary journeys. 
And he's actually done with all three of them by the time he writes Romans. And he's planning now at this point to go to Jerusalem. This is, that visit is referenced in various, you know, in the book of Acts and in, in various letters. And uh, as many of you may know, the purpose of that uh, visit was to take funds from, you know, Christians in the Gentile churches for the poor in Jerusalem and in Judea um, who are suffering under a famine. And, uh, you know, uh, one, of, one, of the, uh, one of the ways in which I think God has brought our worldwide family together over the past year is uh, that, that I think here, you know, here in the UK, um, uh, you know, a, a couple of times down in London, maybe here as well, we've been able to take up offerings for uh, disciples affected by the pandemic in, in various parts of the world where uh, they don't have the kind of the economic support that we're privileged to have in this country. Can I still say this country even though I came from England? Is that all right? Yeah, just right about. You'll tolerate it, all right? <laughs> Amen. Uh, thanks so much. Amen. Uh, I know you were. All, I know you were all cheering for uh, cheering for England. The football right? <laughs> oh, Okay. We won't, we won't go into that. All right. We won't do a poll. All right. Uh, amen. But but you know, um, Paul, Paul. They they that that was what they were doing. They were trying to support those those uh, those disciples. And so Paul had his plans all laid out. You know, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. And uh, we're going to, you know, it's going to be great. We'll take those gifts for the poor disciples there. And then I'm going to come to Rome. And then I want you guys to help me to, uh, uh, you know, to go to Spain. Okay? Because what do you do if you're a minister and you're aging and you've done a lot of work? And of course you want to go to Spain. Right? That's what you want to do. But see, he, this is just to give you an idea of, of what, it, uh, what it all looked like. Okay? So he'd done all his missionary journeys. And he says, does this have a... Yes, it does. He says from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. Illy Illyricum is this Roman colony here. Today it covers um, all kinds of places. Parts of Albania and Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia. Macedonia and Croatia. And yeah, that's right. All, all along this coast. And it was all done. And he was writing to the Romans, you know, here. He wanted to come here and then sh shoot off west to Spain to preach the gospel. And, you know... He's got these plans, and almost, we don't know if he ever made it to Spain. I don't think he did. But um, he did get to Rome, but he had no idea that he was going to be arrested in Jerusalem. And then he was going to be, you know, up in Caesarea. And it, it, this would all happen for over a period of, for a number of years, that arrest would be prolonged. And then he'd, he appealed to Caesar and was taken. And at the end of the book of Acts, we actually do find him in Rome, but he's under a house arrest. Mm -hmm. And yet, the point is, God's plans are greater than our plans. You say, how, how, why is that greater? He ended up in prison. Well, just think about it. When he was called, the, the, the prophecy about him was that, he, you know, not just that he would preach the Gentiles, but he, that he would testify before kings and governors. And when you read the accounts of what happened, how did God bring it about? How did God bring about that he testified to Caesar's household and and, and, you know, we read in Philippians that some from Caesar's household became Christians and so on. How did that all happen? Well, it happened through his imprisonment. And the, the book of Proverbs tells us the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Mm -hmm. Paul had his plans, and it's good to have plans as Christians. We should have plans. But at the end of the day, we need to submit those plans to God, right. you know, being confident that whatever God does... Um, is greater than whatever we could imagine, even though it may not seem like it at the time. Okay, um, uh, you know, little did he know. Um, I think of the the Cardiff planting, and uh, I believe we've got we've got a couple of Scots down there, don't we? Lorna's, Lorna. Lorna's down there, and Ella's down there. And, yes. Yeah, come on, and uh, they're doing great, by the way. Helen did a uh, a midweek on on uh, on Wednesday for the sisters in Cardiff. And uh, she was just beaming and gushing afterwards. She was telling me, oh, that. And she shared about uh, Ella and Lorna and all, all the individual people that she met in the fellowship on Zoom, the Zoom fellowship that we've all become so good at. And like everybody's saying, hallelujah for the real fellowship. Amen. It's good to be back. Um, but, but, I mean, you know, it was planned. It was supposed to go out. And then we had the pandemic. And, you know, um, and then... We sent Zach and Rebecca there a little bit early. We said, you know, there's not much you can do in London. 
why don't you just go off in September or something? I think they went in September to Cardiff. And we thought, great, because during the summer things were easing, remember? And we thought, okay, as long as it keeps going, you know, they'll be able to do something there. And um, I think Ella was there around the same time. She was beginning uni and a few others. And, and, and then we went into greater lockdown all over again, you know, that long lockdown. And uh, what, what do you do? You know, the team all got there, almost everybody got there by the 29th or 30th of December, and it's just lockdown. And it was, you know, it was kind of discouraging, but I appreciate the brothers and sisters, because they were all, you know, they prayed, and they cut on their knees, and they fasted, and they, you know, they became experts at the, whatever, the neighborhood app, and the meetup app, and um, they just did whatever they could, and God blessed them, and they had visitors, and they had studies, and, you know, one lady's been baptized already, and another one was... Um, restored to the church, and um, and there are several people studying the Bible, and you know uh, things will only get better and go from from strength to strength. What about us in our lives? What about us in our lives? What is it that we, you know, that we have on our hearts, but you know we mentally we've kind of checked out and put it on hold until a more convenient time? You know, what could God, if we really let God be God? What could He do even this summer? Wow. You know, as, as opportunities open up, what could God do, even this summer? Listen, it's time to, you know, as, as God allows, hopefully more and more and more restrictions ease, as God allows us that, it's time to, you know, talk to one another and remember the plans and the dreams that we had. Maybe you had some plans at the start of the year. Um, I want to encourage you to think in terms of possibilities. What could God do if... Yeah. You know, if you went through all your contacts, if you went through your phone book and, 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 and got back to all the contacts that you have from, I don't know, from, from as long as you like, you know, maybe from day dot, all of them maybe, you know, and start, start arranging to meet up and have coffees or invite them to Bible discussion or um, get them to attend church online or hallelujah, in person even. Um, what could God do? Wow. What could God do? You know, um, I remember last year, um, you know, uh, just bef- there, there, was, there was a guy who we had met, uh, myself and another brother had met, Jamie Akinbe. Do you guys know Jamie? <laughs> he's partly Nigerian. Yeah, he's, he is one quarter Scottish. I want you to know that. He is. There's, there's, there's a quarter of him that is Scottish, another quarter is Nigerian, and half of him is Indian, so we're claiming him. Right? <laughs> Officially, we're claiming him as the world's tallest Indian. And uh, there you go. But, uh, but, but anyway, Jamie and I met, met this fella, and uh, Joe, great guy, such a nice fella. But only one problem, he wouldn't come to anything. And we met him in the summer of 2019, and we would text him, and he was so friendly, and he'd send me photos of his children, and this and that, and you know. And, and then, in the first week of the lockdown last year, um, I, I see these missed calls from him. And I'm like, what is going on? And so I talked, it was literally, the Prime Minister had announced the first lockdown on whatever it was, March the 23rd, and a couple of days later, uh, in 2020, and a couple of days later, I'm getting these calls, and... And then I talk to him and he tells me, Mohan, he said, so many things have happened since you reached out to me. And he talked about, he talked about, uh, well, I won't go into all the details. There were, there were personal family things that had happened. There were things to do with his property that had happened. Just disasters, you know. And, and, and he said, my, my friends and my family have been advising me, you ought to maybe go to this pastor or that church or you ought to go and get counseling from this group and... He said, but the thing that keeps playing in my mind is the way that you reached out to me that day. And, the, you know, and he just, I, you know, he just, I didn't know it was making any difference. I thought I wasn't having any, making any difference because he wasn't coming. I thought there's another friendly fella who's just not interested. But, but, but I wasn't allowing for God to work, for the spirit to be working in his life. And, you know, on that day, he said, you know, I, I, even though my people have told me you should go here, you should go there. It just stayed in my mind, and I feel like, I feel like, you know, I'm meant to, I'm meant to seek God, and, and I, I need you to help me, you know. And I said, sure. And so he came to online church in, in West London that Sunday, and he came to online church, and he started looking. He said, I know some of these people. <laughs> he said, that's my cousin Uwa and his wife. That's my, that's my nephew, Osaze and Isoza. He looked at them, he said, I know these. So this is the church they go to. 
<laughs> and, uh, and it was literally, it was his, his, I think it's his first cousin, who, who uh, one of our elders who's in West London, is his first cousin. And, uh, and, and so that was an amazing thing. And we studied the Bible, and, and, and during the summer, Joe was baptized and became our brother in Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Still reaching out to his wife, and he has three beautiful little children. And, but what could God do? You know, the thing is, we, we, we give up, but God isn't working necessarily to our plans or rhythms or, or, or timetable. But, but all those people you've reached out to at one time or another, God hasn't stopped working in their lives. Right. And so, listen, God's plans are greater than ours. What could God do? Let's let God be God and, uh, and, 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 and start thinking. Maybe, maybe, maybe something to do even today before the day is over is sit with your spouse or your, your, a, a flatmate or a friend in the church or just by yourself and have a prayer. And maybe just write down what, you know, if I really started dreaming and if I really started praying or if I, even just what is something that I would want God to do? What's a desire of mine that God would do before the summer is over? What would that be? Let's write them down and pray about them and share them with one another. Let's think in terms of possibilities. You know, Paul was, he, it was good for Paul to be dreaming about evangelizing in Spain. Okay, and he was thinking, ah, and he had all these plans. I'll take this awesome gift for the poor in Jerusalem, and then I'm going to come to Rome, and you fellas are going to help me to go to Spain, and I'll, maybe we'll get a mission team together, and... Little did he, he didn't know God's plan was, okay, you go to Jerusalem, you get imprisoned, hang around in prison for a few years, reach out to all kinds of people in Caesar's household, and then you'll be in Rome. He didn't know that was God's plan. And during that time, by the way, he wrote Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, and it's pretty good, pretty good, you know, useful time. Mm. That impact that lasted a couple of thousand years, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's what happened during that time. That was, maybe he wouldn't have written those letters if he'd been free as a bird and off to Spain, you know. Uh, you know, who knows? And, uh, and so God has his plans and they're greater than our plans. Point number two, the gospel is for all of life. Amen. The gospel is for all of life. Now, um, let me just go back to the text. All right. So look at what he says. He says, he says, um, you know, oh, well, let me not do that. Otherwise I'm going to lose my points. Here it is. He talks about how he wants to impart a gift. Okay. Cause this, my points are on the slide. I'm sorry. But anyway, he says he, he wants to impart a gift to them. Okay, he says, I, I, I want to come, I want to impart some gift to you, some spiritual gift. That is, he says, that you and I might be mutually encouraged. He's looking forward to that when he goes and meets the Romans, whenever, that would, whenever God would allow that. He says, I hope to have a harvest among you. You know, I, I'm eager to preach the gospel also to you at Rome. Okay, now stop for a moment. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the church in Rome. And since it's the church in Rome, that's Christians in Rome. Okay, because the church is full of Christians. Amen. That's a Amen. deep insight. Yeah. And, uh, and, but he's saying, I want to preach the gospel to you. But they're Christians. So why would he need to preach the gospel to them? Do you see? Because normally when we talk about preaching the gospel, what we mean is studying the Bible with people to teach them how to become a Christian. Okay, it's great to know Harry was baptized recently. Come on. That's yeah. awesome. Me. You know, we, we, I've got to tell you, man, there are people all over the UK who are praying for you. Rubik, Rubik would share, we're studying with Harry, we're studying with Harry. I'd be praying. I'd be, I, I, have a, I have a list on my phone and I'd be praying, oh God, help Harry. And I, as I do for many other people who are studying the Bible. And, uh, and so, so do many others. But, but he's saying, he, you know, he's saying, I want to preach the gospel to you. To, to people who already are Christians, people who already are disciples, to people who already are saved. Okay, why? Why is that? Well, the reason is the gospel is for all of life. We're used to thinking about the gospel as this is the plan of salvation. And it is. It does include the plan of salvation. But really and truly, the gospel is for all of life. What the Bible teaches us, what the New Testament teaches us is that all of our lives as Christians, as we seek to imitate Christ, every aspect of our life is to be shaped by the gospel message. Amen. The gospel message is that Jesus died, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead on the third day, that he now sits at the right hand of the Father. That somehow, mysteriously, if you're a Christian, you're in Christ. You know, you're seated here in this hotel room, and simultaneously, you're seated in Christ. Yeah. 
at the right hand of the Father at the same time. And, and the growth as a Christian is all about trying to live that gospel-shaped life, that cross-shaped life, sometimes it's called. Trying to have a cross-shaped heart in every area of your life. What does that mean? That sounds really vague. The gospel is the basis of all life and decisions for a Christian. And we see this over and over again in the teaching in the Bible about how to grow, how to live, how to mature as a Christian. We see a constant reference back to the cross, back to the resurrection, back to the gospel. In our relationships, you know, we are to, we are to what? We're to love one another and forgive one another and bear with one another. How? As in Christ, God accepts us and forgives us and bears with us. That's the reference point. Remembering what Jesus did and how he loved us and how the cross defined his life. Because when, when we say that Jesus died on the cross for us, yeah, he did that in a moment in time, on a particular day in time, that we can mark on our calendars amazingly every year, um, remembering it. But, but that picture also represents how he lived all of his life, even before he died on the That's cross. Right. What do I mean by that? Well, he died to himself. He laid down his life and put his father ahead of him and put us ahead of him. And we are to do the very same in our relationships. In, in marriage, how does a husband love his wife? Well, as Christ loved the church. How does a wife love her husband? Well, as the church loves Christ. There's a, a picture that's being played out in our marriages, in our parenting. How do we, how do we love our children? Well, in a Christ-like way. How do children love parents? In a Christ-like way. Um, you know, in the workplace, the relationship, you know, in those days, it talks about obviously masters and slaves, but it's a, it's a pretty good picture for, you know, workplace relationships today, even though we don't have, thank God, the institution of slavery anymore. But, 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 but that picture of, you know, the employer should, should, should remember that he has a master in heaven. Right? Isn't that what the Bible says? And, and, and the worker should serve, you know, um, not just for eye service, you know, it says, but, but sincerely from the heart as though work serving the Lord. All those pictures are taken from um, the gospel. Godliness in all areas is formed by relating what you do to the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel is for all of life. Amen. Um, and then by the time Paul writes Philippians 3, he says our very goal can be summarized as this. I want to know Christ and the fellowship of sharing with him in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. That's our goal. I want to know Christ intimately, personally, and more and more through imitating um, him as he went to the cross and therefore was raised from God's power, um, through God's power. You know, um, last Sunday in our UKY um, service, um, we all were privileged to hear from Sam Powell, and uh, he spoke from, from John 13, didn't he? That's that amazing, amazing passage, and his message was titled, As I Have Loved You. And what was that message about, really? It was about this very thing. It's how we apply the gospel in our lives, in sacrificial love, Okay, in, in self-giving, okay, a sacrificial cross-centered love is a self-giving love and it applies very practically in how we use our time, in how we use, use and give our money, in how we, um, you know, use all of our resources. Um, he talks about that sacrificial love, he talks about that forgiving love in our relationships, and he talks about that visionary love that, that, that Jesus had. Okay. And, uh, and so, what about us today? What area of your life are you excluding the gospel from? What area of your life are you excluding the gospel from? I know, when I was a very young Christian, I was kind of perplexed. Because I thought, you know, in becoming a Christian, I was so taken up with how well and accurately and specifically I was taught the Bible. And uh, I was amazed to see how in a few weeks, you know, the power of the word was changing my life. But then, for, you know, when I was a very young Christian in our church, nobody had even put together a follow-up studies series. I'm excited now we've got, we've got 40 day studies and follow-up studies and, you know, we keep teaching the Bible even to young Christians. Yeah. 
But it, when I became a young Christian, a lot of those things had not yet been developed yet. And so for me, I was kind of confused. I thought, until this point, people have been really interested in teaching me the Bible. And now it kind of feels like I'm supposed to just depend on, depend on what? You know, depend on human wisdom or something, you know? And fortunately, you know, that, that all got, uh, got, got changed. But as, as Christians, we can be like this. You know, we can be all excited about teaching people the Bible in order to get them to be baptized. Um, or we can be really excited about applying the Bible in our own life in limited areas. But then in other areas of life, we simply rely on human wisdom of various forms. What is it in your life that you're excluding the gospel from? You know, is it in your marriage? You know, is it in your workplace? Um, is it in a big decision that you've got to make in your life? Where to go to uni? Or, you know, should I move somewhere else? Or, um, you know, do I need to be looking for another job? Perhaps there's a big decision in front of you. Or maybe it's just an area of your life where there are a series of small decisions that you need to make, you know, such as, um, I don't know, just, just daily, daily family living or, or relationships in your Bible discussion or family group, you know. What, what area of your life are you excluding the gospel from? How, how would it benefit you if you applied a gospel-related thinking um, in that area of your life? In other words, if you stopped and thought, listen, Jesus died and he laid down his life and that kind of summarizes his philosophy in life. If I depended on God and lived the way that Jesus did, how would that benefit me? In, 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 in whatever area, whatever area that might be in your life. And um, amen. So let's ask ourselves those questions because the gospel is for all of life. And that's why Paul could write to Christians in Rome and say, well, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. Because the gospel is for all of life. Amen. And then finally, the righteous will live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. So... Um, you know, um, he, he, uh, he says uh, here that um, the gospel is the power of salvation for everyone who believes. And he says the righteousness of God is revealed. Um, and that righteousness is by faith from first to last. And he, he quotes a scripture from the book of Habakkuk. Um, namely, the righteous will live by faith. Okay, this is super, super important. Now, after this passage, Paul's going to suddenly launch into kind of a horrible, ugly, let me tell it as it is, you know, here's the picture of the world as it is. That's what he's about to do after this passage. He's going to, he's going to leave, you know, he's not going to mince any words in talking about how, not only how sinful all human beings are, but how <laughs> helpless all human beings are to do anything about their condition. He's going to spell it out in a way that is, that is, you know, maybe is not spelled out anywhere else in the Bible. Okay. All the way from uh, verse 18 and into the next chapter, you know, he's going to tell it like it is. He's going to talk about how people, you know, choose to distance themselves from God. And as a result, the consequence of those choices are just that ever, you know, ever spiraling sinfulness and powerlessness and perversity. And he's going to go on and on about it. And just to help people understand, there's no such thing as a truly good person. Okay, yes, all people do have some good in them because we are made in the image of God. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there's no such thing as a person who deserves to go to heaven or to be right with God purely on our own steam. Mm -hmm. He's going to make that abundantly clear. And so in the light of that, this is super important. He's saying, you know, in Christ, God has provided a way for us to be made right with God, to be in right standing, to be righteous in God's eyes. And that way is faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus, as a representative of all of us, pays the penalty for our sin, and we can be right with him. You know, if you're visiting today, if you're studying the Bible on Zoom, hello everybody. If you're, if you're studying the Bible, and, and you, and, or if you're visiting and you think, this makes no sense to me whatsoever, listen. I understand. I remember many years of my life where it made no sense to me either. And yet, it is really good news, okay? If you're, if you're thinking, boy, I have some, you know, some kind of longings in my heart, 
Um, I, you know, something's missing in my life. Please, please, please ask the person who brought you, you know, to sit down over a cup of coffee and begin to investigate these matters Amen. from the Bible. Because the Bible has some real answers for us. Mm. And it's encapsulated in this idea, the righteous will live by faith. Faith in Jesus is a beautiful thing. It's beautiful because God then looks at us according to our faith and not according to our failures. Okay, we, 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 we can walk around, I know I can, feeling terribly low, um, emotionally going up and down, um, feeling guilted out, useless. I know I felt that many times and still struggle with that sometimes. And, and, and yet, it's comforting to know that God has provided a way to deal with my guilt and to look at me and regard me not on the basis of my failures, but on the basis of my faith. A, few, a couple of chapters uh, away, Paul's, Paul's going to start talking about the example of Abraham, who's a picture, maybe the foremost picture apart from Jesus, of faith in the Bible. And he's going to say this, starting from verse 19 of chapter 4. He's going to say about Abraham, without weakening his, in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. So he's telling the story of how God called Abraham at the sprightly age of 75 and said, leave your country, your father's household, and go to a land I will show you. And Abraham, off he went. And, uh, and he said, you know, you're going to have a son. You, his, his wife was, was um, 65 at the time, and they'd never had any children. And he said, he told him, you're going to have a son, and through that son, all nations will be blessed. And Abraham was like, okay, 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 let's okay, I, I think I believe this, you know. And, uh, and, and, and he says, without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his, to, to fulfill that promise, it took 25 years. So in fact, Abraham was now 100 and Sarah was 90. And then the promise was fulfilled. And, and, and Paul says, you know, Ab Abraham is an example of faith because he believed and he says, without weakening in his faith, you know, verse 20, he didn't waver through unbelief. Man, wonderful. What? Those of you who know the story, what do you mean he didn't waver? If you've read the story, um, you know, you should be thinking, excuse me, he didn't waver? I thought he did waver, you know? He did, in fact, waver. You know, if you read the story, some of it, some of what you see is direct. Some of his wavering is directly talked about. Some of it is inferred by things he did and said. And it seems like uh, at least three times um, or in three different ways, through three different people, Abraham tried to take control of God's promise. In other words, rather than wait for God to fulfill his promise, Abraham tried to take control of the whole, here's a son through whom I can build a family thing. Okay, when, 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 Abra when God told Abraham, leave his country and his father's household, God didn't say anything about taking his nephew Lot with him, but he did. And scholars think that was the first kind of a, maybe the nephew could be the adopted son, you know. Um, then at another point when God uh, confirms the covenant with Abraham, I think in Genesis 15, Abraham said, in effect, he said, what's the point? I don't, I don't have a son. I don't have any children. And he said, you know, Eleazar of Damascus, he's the one, one of his servants. He's the one who's going to inherit. And it's kind of like he was making a proposition. Maybe we could do this through Eleazar, you know. And then most sordidly of all, you know, mm. just the weird story of, of uh, uh, Sarah saying, hey, here's my, here's my servant, Hagar, you know, Abraham, sleep with her and have a son and he can be the son. And then Ishmael was born, you know, and God... I mean, Abraham told God at one point, oh, that Ishmael might live under your blessing. But that wasn't God's plan. Abraham, so what does that mean? He didn't waver. He did waver. Um, he tried to control what was going on. But the thing about Abraham was over a period of years, though he seemed to get discouraged and 
you know, wrestle control away from God with, with, the, with the promise and so on. He had a way of always bouncing back. When you look at his life over a period of years, he did have that humble, teachable spirit. And we see it most strikingly in Genesis 22. The son is born, Isaac is born. Some years later, God gives him this, you know, awful test of, of go and sacrifice your son, your only son, Isaac. And Abraham is willing to do it. And thousands of years later, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us Abraham reasoned that if God told him that, then there must be a reason. You know, God was not going to, by this time he had no doubt, God was not going to renege on his promise. So if God told him that, then he'd probably raise Isaac back from the dead. That's how Abraham reasoned, the Hebrews writer tells us. But see, Abraham's heart had changed. There's a, one of the things we see in, in the Bible is that biblical characters go through different phases of faith. And so do we. So when we, look at Abraham, when we look at Abraham's life or the life of others in the Bible, or I dare say some of our lives, yes. um, you know, I think there's kind of a, a faith you begin with that's a young faith. We, we believe a lot that God, God just is going to bless us. And it's kind of summarizing the idea of, you know, I'm going to pray and God's going to take care of me. He's going to bless me. And with Abraham, yes, he did make that big decision of leaving his country, his father's household, going to an unknown place. But the Bible records how God made his flocks multiply and his herds multiply. And he could see visibly the tangible, material blessings of God in his life. And many of us could share the same thing. Yeah. You know, but that's kind of a young, in, in some ways, immature faith. And then many biblical characters go through a crisis of faith. The, the psalmists, um, and cap, you know, they... Um, Encapsulate that well in, in some in some of the psalms, in some of their cries. You know, God, why why are you so far away? How long, O Lord? You know, we, we see those uh, those kinds of prayers. And for Abraham, those twenty five years when the promise was not fulfilled was perhaps that crisis of faith. But then finally, there's a, a surrendered faith, a faith that comes out the other end, and you know, is found in the words, "Father, your will be done." not mine. Like Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. And for Abraham, that willingness to sacrifice Isaac was perhaps the sign of that surrendered faith. And, uh, and that's what God wants in, the, in each one of our lives. So, in conclusion, right? God's plans are not our plans. The gospel is for all of life and the righteous will live by mm. faith. With regard to faith, where, where are we at today? Maybe we have that young faith Maybe right now we're going through that crisis of faith. And uh, again, maybe it's time to reach out, ask for help, um, you know, talk to someone. The goal is God wants us to have that deep and rich faith, which, which does, by the way, keep on asking and receiving, but, but which also is able to surrender to God's will, to God's timing, to the knowledge that at the end of the day, God's plans are greater than our plans. No one lived this out, out better than Jesus Christ. And uh, in a moment, we are going to remember that the essence of that gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The Bible teaches us that even though he was, he was God, yet he humbled himself, became a human, and was obedient to his father to death, even death on a cross. The Bible exhorts us to follow that same example. So in a moment, do you guys do two prayers or one? Yeah. Just one prayer. All right. In a moment, we're going to take the... Uh, the, the, the wafer, the bread, that represents the, uh, the bro broken body of Jesus, and the juice that represents the, uh, the blood that was spilled for us on the cross. And uh, um, amen. Uh, I pray that God will help us to have um, that faith and that walk with him that is promised in Christ. Let's pray together. God, it's great to be able to pray. Thank you, God, for this, this beautiful day that you've given us. And uh, thank you for the amazing love that you have for us because of Jesus. Thank you so much, God, for the fact that though we're helpless, you do provide a way for us to be right with you. And not only right with you, but blessed beyond our wildest dreams, Father. Father, wherever we are right now, I pray, God, that uh, we can remember the example of Jesus. And as we look to him, help us to recognize, God, that uh, there is so much joy and peace and righteousness in him. And uh, Lord, uh, thank you uh, for him being willing to live daily surrendered to you and uh, giving to us 
and uh, help us, God, to lean on him. Um, to, uh, Father, we thank you so much for what he did for us. And Father, help us, God, to follow his example. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.